The U.S. wants to deepen its relations with Vietnam. The once warring countries already share strong trading ties. Closer political and military cooperation, however, presents Hanoi with a difficult balancing act. So why is Washington wooing Vietnam? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Derini Nabugeda. They were once at war, and now 50 years after American forces pulled out of Saigon, Washington continues to build closer ties with Vietnam. It's located in one of the world's most contested geopolitical hotspots with increasing military and naval competition between the U.S. and China, not least over Taiwan. Washington has been seeking to increase its influence in the area by forging new alliances against China. So, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been in Hanoi for talks with Prime Minister Pam Min Chin and other leaders. His trip came just after the 50th anniversary of America's withdrawal of combat forces from South Vietnam and the end of its direct military involvement in the Vietnam War. Blinken enthused about a new era of cooperation without mentioning Vietnam's giant neighbor, China. I also focused on how our countries can advance a free and open Indo-Pacific one that is at peace and grounded in respect for the rules-based international order. Uh, when we talk about free and open, we mean countries being free to choose their own path and their own partners, uh, and that problems will be dealt with openly, rules will be reached transparently and applied fairly, and goods, ideas, and people will flow freely across land, the seas, the skies, and cyberspace. Well, for 20 years, the U.S. was at war with North Vietnam. The legacy of the conflict lingers on with chemical agents and unexploded bombs still causing illness and injury. Estimates vary, but at least 1.3 million people were killed. Since then, there has been a remarkable transformation in ties driven by business. Trade between the two countries has grown 200-fold since diplomatic normalization was achieved in 1995. Last year, total trade in goods exceeded $138 billion, with Vietnam being among America's top 10 largest trading partners. The U.S. is Vietnam's number one export market. Altogether, Vietnam posted a $116 billion trade surplus with the U.S., led by shipments of goods like electronics, clothing and footwear. Well, the ruling Communist Party holds unchallenged political control in the country, and it's been sharply criticized by international organizations over its human rights records. Human Rights Watch calls it dire in virtually all areas. And an Amnesty International report stated, independent journalists, activists, religious practitioners and other government critics were arrested and charged under repressive laws. Human rights defenders were subjected to widespread harassment, digital surveillance, arbitrary arrest and politically motivated prosecution. Torture and other ill treatment continued to be reported at an alarming rate. Well, this is something Blinken was challenged about in Hanoi. With regard to uh, human rights and uh, the relationship that, that we have, this is a conversation that we regularly uh, engage in. And as we've, um, we've said to our counterparts, it's very important that uh, we continue to speak directly, openly, candidly uh, about our concerns. And that's exactly, uh, exactly what we do. To discuss all of this, I'm joined by our guest from Singapore is Chong Jai-in, who's an associate professor of political science at the National University in Singapore. He's also a non-resident fellow at Carnegie China. From Colchester in the UK, we're joined by Natasha Lindstadt, who's the deputy dean of education in the Department of Government at the University of Essex. Natasha is also a U.S. foreign policy specialist. Joining us from Seoul is Donald Kirk, who's a veteran correspondent and author of Who's Covered Asia and v He's also covered Asia and Vietnam extensively. Warm welcome to you all. Thanks so much for your time. Donald Kirk, so Vietnam has been on the recent itineraries of senior officials of the Biden administration, like the vice president, like the defense secretary. But how significant is this visit by Blinken and why now? 
Well, I think it's extremely significant. Uh, clearly, Vietnam uh, wishes to uh, uh, get along with both China, its immediate and huge neighbor, and with the United States. Uh, in a sense, Vietnam can play the U.S. against China. Vietnam has some specific problems with China over over who's controlling the sea out there, over uh, over drilling for oil and natural gas under the water. And also there's some islands that the Vietnamese would very much like to recover, including the Paracels, which uh, were once Vietnamese islands, but taken over by China just, just before the end of the Vietnam War. So uh, there are a lot of issues, that the, and the United States can, uh, can put on the, the, an appearance of supporting Vietnam and perhaps giving Vietnam some leverage in negotiations with China. Uh, I should add, uh, the, Mr. Blinken, while he was in Hanoi, participated in the groundbreaking for construction of a huge new American embassy in Hanoi. Uh, I think the embassy is going to cost well over a billion U.S. dollars. Uh, and um, and it, you know, it'll take a few years to build it, but it's an immense embassy that they're building there. In other words, it's a huge American presence in this. Right, and right. Let, let like, me just ask you about that. Symbolically, I mean, what does this tell us, tell us symbolically? And the price of that embassy, in fact, is $1.2 billion. So you're right, it's well over a billion. Right. Uh, the fact that America is placing such emphasis on Vietnam has a lot to do not just with Vietnam, but obviously with America's policy about China. Uh, it's um, America has set up uh, what, uh, what amounts to a policy of containment. Certainly the Chinese think it's a policy of containment against China. Uh, and uh, they see Vietnam as uh, fitting in with this policy. Not that they, not that Vietnam is going to be an enemy of China. Vietnam cannot afford to consider being an en enemy of its, of its huge northern neighbor. But uh, Vietnam can certainly play the U.S. against China, uh, can certainly uh, fall upon the U.S., not only for trade, as was pointed out, huge trade, but also for a lot of support, a lot of diplomatic right. support on very sensitive issues. Yeah, okay, all important points you've raised, which we'll, which we'll drill down to in just a moment. But first, let me bring in uh, Natasha from the UK. What do you think about this visit? What does the timing of it signal to you about what the US is looking to get out of this? Right, well, I would agree with what had already been said, that the, the US is trying to get closer to Vietnam to upgrade the relationship uh, as a way of, of countering China's, from the U.S.'s perspective, increasing assertiveness or aggressiveness uh, in the region and, and just globally. Uh, so the U.S. is hoping that this relationship is going to get stronger, both with security issues, and they are trying to, you know, at least discuss sending over uh, ships uh, for the, the Coast Guard in Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam had previously gotten most of its vessels from Russia, and as Vietnam's trying to rely less on Russia, the U.S. is trying to come in there. No word if that's going to get passed by lawmakers, but the U.S. is also trying to increase its bilateral economic ties, and it sees Vietnam as a really important piece to its Indo-Pacific strategy of, of countering China, and it's trying to convince Vietnam that China's assertiveness in the South China Seas poses a threat to Vietnam, uh, and that these bilateral trade ties are really important, as had already been mentioned. Uh, Vietnam exports most of its goods to the U.S. It's number one uh, exporter. It goes to the U.S., over $109 billion worth of goods. And while officially China is Vietnam's biggest uh, trading partner, uh, that's really because Vietnam is importing many uh, Chinese goods. So there are important economic relationships with, with both countries, but I think for Vietnam, they don't want to antagonize China. It's geographically too close to China. There's a long history with China. And so they don't want to be too open about uh, whatever role they might be playing in, in the U.S.'s efforts uh, to, to counter rising China's uh, power. Right, okay. And Natasha, you were mentioning a moment ago the upgrade in relationships. The U.S. has been pushing for, uh, a, for a boost in relations with Vietnam to what's called a strategic partnership. Um, how likely is that to happen now? 
So we don't have word if this has happened yet after this recent meeting. I think the U.S. is trying to push for this, and it's possible that Biden will make an official visit to Vietnam in, in July. Uh, so from the U.S.'s perspective, they definitely want this. But as I already mentioned, from Vietnam's perspective, they want to increase some of these security and economic ties that they have with with the U.S. just just for their own uh, you know pragmatic reasons, rational reasons that it may benefit them, they they have to be very careful about anything that they do that could upset Beijing. Uh, so they don't want to be too open or outward about this. So I don't know if this is going to be something that is official, uh, officially declared by both countries. Okay, um, Ian. So uh, we've been hearing that U.S. officials are reluctant to describe this visit or or really any visit to Asia. Uh, in terms of China, preferring instead to discuss the importance of improving bilateral ties. But um, from where you sit, uh, how much do you think China is actually the focus here? So I think China is part of the consideration, but I don't think it's all of the consideration. So for the U.S., I think it's pretty important for them to keep a presence uh, in the region. They have a lot of economic interests, as we've talked about. They also invest uh, very significantly in Southeast Asia. And uh, for Southeast Asia, it also provides a vital link between uh, points west and to the U.S. allies, Japan and South Korea. So uh, for, the, for those reasons, I, I think the U.S would like to maintain a robust presence. They are concerned that uh, Chinese efforts uh, are uh, trying to box them out of the region. So um, I think that's the sort of background. The um, the consideration, though, for not actually mentioning uh, China at the forefront is because these relationships, uh, the idea of keeping the U.S. presence uh, in Southeast Asia has to do with you know, creating a sense that the bilateral relationships, the multilateral relationships in Southeast Asia matter in and of themselves. They are not just derivative of the PRC, and they're not just derivative of competition uh, with the PRC. And I think uh, that's something that regional states will sort of take uh, some some heart from. I think the um, less, this is part of the lesson from past U.S. engagement with Southeast Asia. I think uh, many Southeast Asian states, Vietnam included, don't like the fact that, you know, they are sort of secondary. They're instrumental instrumental uh, to larger U.S. interests elsewhere. And so to be able to maintain and nurture that cooperation, the U.S. has to emphasize that the relationship has a quality of its own. And certainly, I think re regional states like Vietnam have an interest in further engagement. Uh, they have— Right, but for Vietnam, how much of a difficult balancing act is this? I mean, cooperating with, with Washington, but at the same time, as has been alluded to, without upsetting Beijing? So it's it's going to be difficult. Uh, Beijing, as uh, many people have seen, have have been pretty bristly uh, recently. So um, there's the importance of not uh, upsetting Beijing. But I would also throw in that there's a certain domestic element. Governments uh, that ha are in disputes uh, with the PRC, uh, Vietnam looms large here. I mean, they have a domestic sentiment that I think will punish their leaders if they seem to be caving in. So working with the U.S. is one way to square that. So there are multi-dimensions uh, to this relationship that uh, we, we should not forget. Uh, and I think sometimes looking from the outside in, the domestic dimensions uh, get a little bit forgotten. Let's talk about the domestic dimensions with Donald Kirk. I mean, you've covered Vietnam uh, for so long, Donald. How, how do you think that the, the public actually view uh, the United States and also this relationship with the U.S.? Well, in my return visits to Vietnam, uh, uh, I and a lot of other Americans who've been back there are always surprised by the, by the affection, if you can believe it, that many Vietnamese feel for the United States. Uh, you don't encounter, you know, anti-Americanism or derisive remarks. Uh, of course, if you if you looked hard enough, I'm sure you could find them. But uh, basically, uh, people are quite friendly and quite courteous, courteous toward Americans. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I totally understand why, uh, since it was a terrible war in which the Americans were to blame for ongoing problems. Uh, we're talking about the, uh, you know, the Agent Orange issue, where which continues to maim and stunt the lives of many people. Uh, in the region where Agent Orange was dropped in a in a misbegotten effort to uh, to uh, kill the jungle and expose the hiding places of troops of Vietnamese communist North Vietnamese troops, we call them. Uh, I go back to that old wartime term. We there was North Vietnam and South Vietnam. We don't say North Vietnam and South Vietnam. We just say Vietnam these days. But 
If you were there during the war, it was North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Okay, so, so the many favor, regions... favor expanded ties with the U.S. Do you think? I, I think I think that they do uh, favor expanded ties with the U.S. And I think that uh, for uh, someone who was there during the war, for any American, Vietnam can be a, a, quite a pleasant place to visit. Now, there may be difficulties in trade negotiations, as there are with every country. Uh, we have a lot of difficulties with trade negotiations with allied countries, now, much less Vietnam. One issue that I should mention here is that the U.S. very much wants to keep the South China Sea an open waterway. China claims the South China Sea is Chinese. They say it's their, it's their territory. Uh, Vietnam is, of course, on the South China Sea, and the U.S., uh, by this relationship with Vietnam, is, is showing that it wants, that it very much supports the openness of the South China Sea, uh, which would include Vietnam's rights to do uh, as it wishes in the South China Sea, including uh, oil and, and, and gas exploration. So uh, that's, the South China Sea issue is very important. On the other right. side of the South China Sea is the Philippines, uh, which also has problems with China in the South China Sea, which the United, with which the United States is conducting war games right now uh, and, and, and um, very much supporting uh, Philippines' claims to the South China Sea. So all that uh, fits into, uh, in, into what the United States is doing in Hanoi. Yeah, okay, let's bring in uh, Natasha on that point, particularly on the South China Sea. As Donald was just mentioning, uh, the U.S. has military bases in the Philippines. It's bolstered military cooperation with Taiwan. To what extent is there real comprehensive maritime security cooperation right now between Washington and Hanoi, Natasha? And, and where do you see that heading to? Well, I, I think, as we had already mentioned a little bit, that th there are, are concerns with China's increasing assertiveness about the, the South China Sea. Uh, and also, it's increasing aggressiveness with, with Taiwan, uh, and would, would China take action in Taiwan? And, and that's concerning to, to not just the U.S. and Taiwan, but also to other countries in the region, including Vietnam. And so that really drives... Uh, you know, home the the need to have a little bit more security uh, cooperation taking place there. But of course, like I said, they need to tread uh, carefully here with anything that they do on a security front because that could escalate things with China further, as it doesn't want the U.S. Uh, to increase its sphere of influence or influence in in the area. It's trying to push the U.S. out. Uh, and, and assert itself uh, more clearly. So I think there's avenues here for more security cooperation. Uh, but like I said, it's it's quite a, a tightrope. It's a very delicate tightrope here. Uh, and and I think from Vietnam's perspective, they're just trying to do what's rational, increase increasing economic ties. This all makes sense. Maybe increasing access to some weapons so that they can diversify themselves away from Russia. Uh, but again, doing so in a way that, that doesn't uh, make things worse or antagonize their relationship with Beijing. Okay, Ian, what do you think? Could there be blowback from Beijing if Vietnam gets too close to the U.S. when it comes to issues of security and military cooperation? Sure. I think uh, Beijing has shown itself to be quite willing to put pressure on its Southeast Asian neighbors, Vietnam included. Um, there's recently been more activity in terms of the uh, PRC uh, doing more um, exploration right off Vietnam's coast. I, Vietnam doesn't like that. Uh, you know, that's a sort of long going dispute. The PRC obviously has a lot more capabilities that it could bring to bear. And Vietnam, that, that's one reason why Vietnam is trying to be very careful. But apart from the um, maritime space, I think uh, Vietnam is also very mindful that the Mekong River, uh, which a lot of its people that depend on for the livelihood, uh, the up the upstream, it runs uh, from the PRC and PRC uh, dam uh, building. There has sort of has really affected the ecosystem and the sort of downstream uh, environment. So one of the concerns that Vietnam also has is that uh, if they get into a really tough situation with the PRC, there are several levers that the PRC could use. This would include trade. This could include the military stuff on the maritime uh, domain, but also uh, stuff that's done on the Mekong uh, upstream of the Mekong River. So that's why I think they. Hanoi probably wants to tread very carefully. They probably would like the additional um, assurance of have, being able to work with the U.S., but they will do so carefully and quietly in ways to avoid any unnecessary friction with the PRC.
Uh, Natasha, under its, uh, the, the um, Obama administration, back in 2011, the former president had announced the pivot to Asia policy, which I'm sure you're very much aware of, to, to deepen America's strategic footprint across the Asia Pacific. And Vietnam uh, stood out as a very important country. Today, if you fast forward to today, 2023, what do you think the U.S.'s strategy is for the region? Has it shifted much from, from what Obama had set out to do? Well, I mean, I think the U.S. has continued to to try to uh, strengthen their ties with Asia, and we've seen that the level of bilateral trade with different countries in Asia has increased, uh, and, and the U.S. is trying to increase its presence. I think that actually the thing that has changed more so than what the U.S.'s behavior has been China's behavior. The China has become much more assertive, not just in Asia, but in Latin America and, and Africa as well. Uh, and has wanted to kind of push the U.S. out. Uh, so we see while the U.S. has been increasing, you know, its its bilateral trade ties with a lot of these countries and trying to work through regional organizations and trying to create a block against China, I, I don't see its behavior changing that much from the Obama administration, but more so we're seeing a much more confident and assertive China on the world stage. Donald, would you say that Vietnam's foreign policy can be somewhat limited due to its sheer proximity to China, that Vietnam will, will always be keen to keep uh, relations with its northern neighbor on a sort of a level playing field? Well, yeah, Vietnam has to, has to be very concerned about China. Uh, the the, the Chinese-Vietnamese relationship goes deep, deep into the history of the region, into their history. Uh, and uh, obviously, they, they, they want to uh, stand up against China, but they don't want to infuriate China either. Um, just getting back to the point I'm about to cough. <coughs> just getting back to the point that uh, w was discussed a minute ago, uh, the battle lines, uh, I hesitate to use the word battle line. Let's say the line of confrontation between the U.S. and China has much sharpened in recent years. Uh, there's There are a couple of quasi-alliances. They're not quite alliances. There's the Quad Four, including India, uh, uh, Japan, U.S., U.K., uh, the Quad Four, which is very much of an anti-Chinese grouping, or can be seen as an anti-Chinese grouping. And there's also AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, the Australian, what is it, A-U, uh, Australia, U-K, U.S. Uh, alliance, uh, which, uh, which also can be seen very much as an anti-Chinese grouping. And certainly the Chinese see it that way. Uh, so... Uh, I would say that since the Obama administration, the, the sense of confrontation has deepened and that and it, it was a little blurry while during the Obama administration, but it's it's now quite sharply defined or getting getting more sharply defined. Right. And what about Donald when it just when it comes to the issue of the of, we were mentioning Russia a moment ago and specifically the war in Ukraine, because what we found recently was that Vietnam uh, did not vote when it comes to U.N. General Assembly resolutions. Vietnam did not vote with the West condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So um, what do you think of that? I mean, uh, there must be growing pressure on Vietnam from the West and particularly from the United States to side uh, with them on the Ukrainian issue. Are you surprised that Vietnam is playing a, um, a, a balancing act here? Uh, no, I wouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, there's no reason for Vietnam to to uh, condemn the, the Russians in Ukraine. What, what, what's, what's Ukraine mean to Vietnam? Uh, they have every reason to want to remain on half decent terms, if not quite good terms with Russia. So there's no reason for them to condemn uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It just isn't, just really, they can see it as not really their their immediate concern. And why should they uh, get involved? Well, uh, okay, get, let's talk about Russia with Ian. Just for the sake of time, I'll jump in there. Ian, I mean, how important is the Russian-Vietnamese relationship when it comes to when it comes to sort of uh, trade issues, oil and gas issues, 
Okay, so I think for oil and gas, cer certainly there is a degree of uh, trade with uh, between Vietnam and and Russia. It's not as obviously not as significant as the U.S., but what is quite key for Vietnam, uh, we mentioned this earlier in the uh, show, is that Vietnam uh, still is quite dependent on Russian technology and Russian equipment. Uh, for its military, right? So its ability to stand up uh, to China, its ability to maintain its presence uh, on the South China Sea is trying to wean away from that. But, you know, the, these are, it's not just the platforms, it's the whole systems, the logistic tail, the maintenance, the skills. So while there's some, uh, you know, slight effort, there's some effort to sort of take in um, technologies from elsewhere, South Korea, there's the Coast Guard cutter from uh, the US, that whole movement, you know, is going to be very long in coming. And so the Vietnamese at this point in time don't really don't don't want to upset Moscow because they have their concerns there too. But what I think is also quite interesting is after the UN votes, um, Vietnamese officials, especially uh, uh, military officials, uh, were actually on Vietnamese TV apparently uh, explaining how they a vote uh, not with the UN doesn't mean that they accept the correctness of an invasion and occupation of another country. They and they sort of brought up their own history uh, to that effect. So I think a lot of what we're seeing is really the difficult and an easy position that Vietnam is faced with and their efforts to really navigate through uh, the, the, the choppy waters that okay. have been created by the, the Russian uh, war. Okay, yeah. we just have about one minute left to the program. Natasha, I'll end with you, and I wanted to ask you about human rights because um, um, uh, human rights organizations do criticize Vietnam for its human rights records. We saw Secretary of State Blinken um, allude to it in his press conference. Is this something that the U.S. is going to turn a blind eye to? Well, I think you're going to see from the U.S., different things that they say openly and diplomatically when they're trying to pursue Vietnam as an important trade partner, and then what might happen if they try to uh, send over ships, lawmakers may block that on human rights grounds. So, I mean, the U.S. is not just one monolithic uh, entity, of course. There's a lot of different groups trying to put human rights front and center, and then there are the diplomatic needs which may um, trump at this moment whatever the uh, needs are to, to to clarify their human rights agenda. And, and I think what will probably be more important is trying to push things forward economically because Vietnam, as we've already mentioned, is so important uh, to okay. the U.S. in its uh, uh, effort to, to counter Chinese growing power. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us, Chong Jai-in, Natasha Lindstedt, and Donald Kirk. We appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Insight Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Insight Story. From myself and the whole team in Delha, thanks for watching and bye-bye for now.